Hi folks, I am here and we are live, but you're seeing the promo because I'm going to take a few minutes to share. We are waiting for Lisa. She did say definitely she would be here tonight, so. I guess she's just a bit late. So let me share. Hmm. Okay. Bonnie is getting little pings and pongs on her computer. Seems like Steve Wolfbrand is here tonight. Haven't seen Steve for a long time. If you are here, Steve, welcome back. Okay, I won't be sharing very long, folks. I won't be doing some shares, of course, but... Just one more now. Okay. Here we are. Thank you all for coming. Let me take away the promo here before I forget. There I am. It says I have only one comment, but I see lots of comments here. Hi, Dolores. Hope you're having a great evening. Hello, Holly. Nice to see you. Lana says, happy Thursday. Why doesn't it feel like Thursday to me somehow? It doesn't quite feel like Thursday. But thank you, Lana. Dolores says, hi. Holly, hi, Lana. Brandy says, hello. Dolores says, hello, everyone. And Dolores says, hi, Steve. Steve is here. Hi, Steve. Glad to see you're back. Brandy says, shared. And Laura says, hi, Brandy. And Carmina says, hi, Joe. Beautiful Bonnie and friends. Got internet for a while. Nice to listen in again, Sherry. Thank you, Carmen. It's wonderful to see you. Kay says, hi. Brandy says, hello, Dolores. And Kay says, hi. Okay. So I'm expecting Lisa any moment. Uh, so we'll have to see when she can get here. But until then, I am going to go ahead. So tonight, I wanted to talk about, first of all, Newsom in the wake of the defeat of AB 1400 in California. There was a post from David Sirota on Newsom's big choices that I thought was of interest or should be of interest to us in any case. So let's go for that one. Uh, 
Ah, this is not by David Sirota, actually. It's from the Daily Poster, but it's about it's from uh, Walker Bragman, as opposed to Dave Sirota. And here it is. In 2018, California's Democratic governor, Gavin Newsom, famously, I should say, it doesn't say famously in the article, but famously signaled his support for a statewide single-payer system. He said, quote, I'm tired of politicians saying they support single-payer, but that it's too soon, too expensive, or someone else's problem, Newsom said in a statement, helping secure him the crucial support of the state's powerful nurses' union during a contentious gubernatorial primary. Now, as California lawmakers, by the way, I hear the ping, which means Lisa is with us. And so I'm going to bring her right in. Hello, Hi. Lisa. Hi, Hello. Joe. I had to reboot my computer twice before I could get in. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, wow. Amazing. Okay. Well, we're in the middle of the piece about Newsom's big choice. Mm. So I'm going to go back to that and go through some of the major points. Uh, this piece, by the way, was written by uh, Walker Bragman for the Daily Post. Oh, I know Walker. And he says, now as California lawmakers um, once again get close to establishing such a program, all eyes are on Newsom to see how he will come down on the issue and whether the millions he and his party receive from health insurance industry donors will convince him to abandon the cause he previously touted. Well, he never publicly abandoned it, but I'm pretty sure he's he was behind a lot of went on a lot of what went on in that particular legislature because I think okay that Anthony Brandon does. Uh, I'm sorry, Anthony. Is it Brandon? Oh, um, uh, but Anthony Rendon. I think Brandon, the speaker, right? Uh, the speaker. Okay, is it Brandon? Okay, or is it Rendon? I think it's Rendon. Yes, Rendon, Speaker of the House. Yep. I think that he owes a lot to Newsom's um, support. And while he's very respectful of the donors as well, he also would do anything to stop a bill from getting onto Newsom's desk. So Newsom had to be responsible, be accountable for the promise that he made. Anyway, uh, a new bill would move to replace the state's private insurance market with the public system, which the government is a single payer for health care services. Due to the rules of the legislature, the bill must pass the state's full assembly by the end of the day on Monday. That, of course, was July 31st, or it's dead for another year. As the Democratic governor, Newsom has significant influence over what the Democratic uh, legislature sends to his desk. But he has remained publicly aloof about the bill, implying he may block it as his industry donors mount um, an opposition campaign. That was some heavy opposition campaign also. Quote, Governor Newsom has no choice but to sign a bill and put it on the ballot as he's promised he wants to, says Jamie Court. President of the Consumer and Taxpayer uh, Advocacy Group, Consumer Watchdog, quote again, I don't think he can get out of that promise. Well, of course, he can get out of it if the whole Democratic uh, uh, Party protects him from having to come face to face with his promise, which is what happened, certainly in this instance. A long battle. The current uh, legislation, AB 1400, would establish a new agency called CalCare that would pay for basic medical services in the state. If it passes, Californians would then vote whether to approve a tax increase to fund the program, a vote that might not happen in 2024. So, boy, they had all kinds of outs, right? Now, even if they passed the legislation, it still wouldn't be funded until 2024. Of course, they buried it. So they didn't even have to go that far. 
It legislation is opposed by a variety of business interests, including the California Chamber of Commerce, the National Federation of uh, 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 Independent Business, and health insurers. Yep. I have not had the opportunity to review that plan, and no one, <laughs> and no one um, has presented it to me. Oh God, he's so full of it. He's such a liar. <laughs> Just so full of it. Now, you mean to you tell know, me he and his aides haven't tried to tear that bill completely apart? Just in case it passed. I have not had the opportunity to review that plan. You know what? Let them. They're so tone deaf and they're so out of touch. And they should. I hope that Rendon and Newsom continue on this path of thinking that they can get away with this so that everybody can watch the charade. Because the more people that realize that this is what is going on, the more people are going to realize that we're going to dump these damned incumbents. You vote for the independents. You vote for the, the Greens or whatever party floats your boat. But guys, we are getting screwed. We certainly are. We certainly and if you didn't watch my interview with um, Amr Sh Shirgil, I will pin it to my profile. Go watch it. Share it. It's gotten almost 40,000 views last time I looked. It, we got to get that around to everybody. Everybody. Yeah, we got to get that around to a million views, people. That has got to go completely viral because that was, I think it was the most wonderful interview that I've ever seen. I mean, really. Well, it's I'm, not. It's not because... I didn't, I, it wasn't my probing or anything. This was his story to tell, and he told it freely. It was he wanted his, to tell that story. It was his story to tell, and he was not trying to resist, absolutely. But Lisa, you asked him the right questions, and in such, in such a nice way, you threw him up the softballs. And he hit them right out of the park. Well, I didn't have to go follow up and contradict or ask him any probing questions. He, he had me, like I told you, nobody makes me nervous. That interview made me nervous. Like it's not often that somebody says that the DN, you know, the DCCC and the DSCC and the party itself, and both parties, by the way, uh, wash money. I mean... <laughs> And he's a lawyer. He picked his words very, very well. And he said, wash money. He mm -hmm. said, wash money. He said that uh, the big money puts all this money into the party committees of the Democrats. And then the Democrats dispense the money to the candidates. And the candidates know very well they're getting laundered money. Why do they need to get the laundered money? Because then no one can tag them, they think, um, by saying, you took the big donor money. No, I didn't. I only took the party committee's money. No, I don't know who was given to the party. No, and, and let's be very frank. He never said the word launder. He said washed. <laughs> He's a very smart man. <laughs> he said wash. Okay. Yes, he did. Okay. Yes, he did. Well, to to, to simple-minded people like me, <laughs> that no. seems like laundered to me. But I I will bow to your greater expertise expertise in this matter, Lisa. Hey, he's a lawyer, man, and he's slick. He knows what he's saying. I'm I'm glad he does, but I also know what I'm saying. So. Oh, sure. Sure, but I just wanted to point that out because I think it it's important to how how yes, how tiptoe through the blades of grass you have to be to play this game. And I don't envy him. I can't imagine who's coming after him now. Pray for him, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, yes, I think you're the only one who who said that. But it, it really struck me as. Definitely true. There must be this huge pressure on him now and threats of all kinds from the party. 
because there are millions of dollars at stake and this guy is getting between them and their money. We need to back him up and amplify him and be there for all of them. Oh, all of God. them. We do. We have to because they just, the Democratic Caucus in California, the Progressive Democratic Caucus in California, their chair just stepped up to the plate and de-pantsed the whole shebang. <laughs> de-pantsed. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay, Newsom. We're continuing. Uh oh, with Newsom now. He recently. Okay, said, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, wait a minute. What is his old girlfriend's name? Man, Donald Trump Jr. is going to be going to be having to worry about her. She'll go back to Newsom. Go ahead. <laughs> She'll go back to Newsom. She dated she him first. Donald Trump. <laughs> she dated him first. Sure. <laughs> well, I think that the ideal system is a single payer system. Uh, so this is a quote from Newsom. I've been consistent with that for well over a decade. But he didn't know the bill was even there. It came out of nowhere. Okay. The difference here is when you are in a position of responsibility, you've got to apply. You've got to manifest the ideal. This is hard work. It's one thing to say. Um, but it's another to do. Okay, yeah, so that's that. You know what that is? That's like I talk out of one side of my mouth and I run on another, right? This is what they all do. This is we what know, they we all, all know this, right? But this. By the way, something. they say yeah. it's one thing to say, okay, but it's another to do what they are saying. You can't believe what I say because. I'm going to do something else. He's admitting it right there. Well, yeah, there is that too. He's going to say it? one thing and he's going to do another or not do anything at all, which yep. is what uh, he's really noted for. California already has near universal health insurance coverage, says the author, uh, Walker Bragman. Thanks to incremental extensions of coverage for undocumented immigrants through the, uh, the Medicaid program, uh, uh, the Medi-Cal program, so-called, and subsidies from the Affordable Care Act, in January, Newsom announced that his new budget, which would ex extend Medi-Cal coverage uh, to documented immigrants of any age, would make California the first state to achieve uh, by universal coverage. So that's what he said. I campaigned on universal health care, he declared, on the day after announcing his plan, and we're delivering that. So he's, he's saying the medical coverage is going to achieve uh, uh, by universal health care coverage in California. Well, of course, it remains to be seen if he does extend that, and it remains to be seen if it's going to get to uh, to universal coverage. I sincerely doubt that you can get to universal coverage in that way. Uh, in achieving near universal coverage through private markets, however, the governor appears to be pivoting away from single payer. No kidding, Walker. The state had been down this roadmap many times before, going as far back as 1918, when voters rejected an effort to create a state health care program for the poor. Um, the single payer legislation finally made it out of committee in 1992 after Governor Jerry Brown, who was a Democrat, of course, endorsed it during a Democratic presidential primary debate that year. But the effort ultimately failed in the state Senate. Then in 1994, the California Nurses Union pushed Prop uh, 186 to establish single payer in the state. Uh, but the measure was overwhelmingly defeated following a campaign by a coalition of business groups, insurance companies, and um, hospitals. 
While state lawmakers succeeded in passing single-payer legislation in 2006, uh, 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 Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger vetoed the bill when it arrived at his desk and vetoed an amended version of the legislation two years later. So notice how brave the Democrats are to pass single-payer when there's a Republican sitting in the governorship. In 2017, when single-payer came up again in California, it appeared more likely to pass. The state had already, had already dramatically expanded health care coverage in response to the Affordable Care Act. Democrats held supermajorities in both chambers of the state legislature, and Brown had once again been elected uh, governor. At the same time, polling showed most Californians supported the creation of a taxpayer funded uh, by universal health care system. The tide seemed to be turning nationally as well. The presidential campaign of uh, Bernie Sanders had exposed um, mainstream America to the concept of Medicare for all. And 27 members of California's congressional delegation had signed on to a, f a federal Medicare for all bill. Uh, but uh, but um, Governor Newsom, Lieutenant Governor at the time, even made single payer health care a plank of his campaign. Yet, once again, the reform efforts were stymied when the Assembly Speaker uh, 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 Anthony Rendon refused to hold a vote on the bill for the duration of that year, even though it had already passed the Senate. According to Rendon, he did so because, quote, there are potentially fatal flaws in the bill, including the fact it does not address many serious issues such as financing, um, also delivery of care, cost controls, or the realities of needed action by the Trump administration and voters need to make it a genuine piece, okay, of legislation. But there was another likely reason the bill died. Um, but big business had stepped in to quash it. As International Business Times said at the time, since 2012, business groups and healthcare companies on record opposing the measure had donated more than $1.2 million to the California Democratic Party. These same groups had also donated more than $1.5 million to Democratic Assembly members, including 82,000 directly to the Rendon. Um, also, Rendon had received more than 101,000 from pharmaceutical companies and 50,000 from health insurance. These same groups donated more than $2.2 million to the state um, Democratic Party. And guess what? There was a $1 million check uh, from, uh, from Blue Shield. They'd been a huge donor to Newsom and the state Democrats, as well as the governor's pet courses. Uh, they had donated at least 99000 to Newsom's campaign since 2010 and $2.7 million to the California Democratic Party since 2006, according to data from the National Institute K on Money and Politics. That includes a $1 million contribution to the state party last summer as Newsom was working to fend off a recall effort. So his, um, his effort to fend off the recall effort was funded in part by a $1 million contribution by Blue Shield of California. State records show that Blue Shield donated $100,000 to Newsom's um, inaugural fund in 2019. And that he's made, and they've made several other sizable contributions on Newsom's behalf. The largest was $20 million donation in 2020 to Enterprise Community Partners to support uh, Project Home Key, the governor's COVID-19 um, 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 housing initiative for the homeless. 
20 million dollars big donation in 2020 um the blue shield gave 300,000 to a nonprofit supporting the commission on the future of work which Newsom had created by an executive order. Okay, the donations were reported as behested payments. The term for when California politicians raise money from corporations or other groups and contribute the money to a nonprofit. Okay, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, um, but Newsom awarded Blue Shield a $15 million note bid a vaccination contract and recruited the insurer's CEO to help shape the state's um, COVID-19 testing strategy. The insurer Anthem and its affiliates have donated $78,000 to this campaign since 2013 on top of $770,000 to the California Democratic Party since 2002. Okay, Anthem also gave 25000 to Newsom's 2019 uh, 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 inaugural fund. And Blue Shield and Anthem are both part of a coalition that is lobbying against the legislation, claiming it would create a new and exorbitantly expensive government uh, by bureaucracy and cause, quote, significant job loss in California. And United Health Group, the nation's largest health insurer, is also opposing the single payer bill and has been pressing its employees to lobby California lawmakers against passing the legislation. So what happened to Assembly Bill 1400? All this is part of what happened to it. The insurance giant has contributed 130,000 to Newsom's campaign since 2011. And five. That's what you can trace. <laughs> yes. And five. We don't know how much of it was washed through the party. Yes, we don't know how much of it was washed through the party. At 513,000 to the uh, state Democratic Party since 2007. So there was some washing there. In 2019, okay, the United Health Group and one of its subsidiaries doted, um, donated 100,000 to Newsom's uh, 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 inaugural fund. Now, whether Newsom's relationship with Blue Shield, Anthem, and United Health will impact his decision making on CalCare is an open question. No, it's not. Court and consumer watchdog. That's really funny. And court says, quote, I've seen him do it and I've seen him not do it. Let's put it that way. He said of the governor's ability to stand up to donors. Quote, I've seen him go uh, against the unions that represent oil companies by putting a limit on setbacks and banning uh, uh, fracking. I don't know. For some issues, like single payer, I've got to believe that he's um, ideological there, unquote. Boy, that is... A Boy, is that a twisted pretzel of a presentation or what? Is, isn't that something? This guy at Consumer Watchdog. Guess his name is Jamie Court at Consumer Watchdog. Yeah, sounds like a commerce guy. Go ahead. He, he is a dreamer. A dreamer. No, oh, that you're the You think he's a dreamer? <laughs> no, I think he's a spin doctor. No, I think he's a spin doctor. A spin doctor. Okay. And you know what? Don't think for a second that you know that wasn't fed to him either. He's he's against frac. He went to he went against labor by yeah. but because he put setbacks on and banning what what is so he's banning fracking and that's him going that makes him a union buster. 
how does that even how how do you of course people are going to be in peril if they're working for a fracking company but you have to as a governor put a decent transition plan in place so that they can get retrained and get better jobs or find them better jobs and you make damn sure you pay them unemployment this is such horseshit sorry but that's what it is i'm sorry don't apologize oh it's just it's infuriating uh, horseshit is horseshit it is and we can smell it all the way from here to California. How about that? Did you see the meme that I put out that's got a picture of all the logos of all of the uh, MSM media, uh, what do you call them, stations, whatever it is? And it's it's a picture of all those logos on a uh, uh, set for like a news set. And it says lights, camera, bullshit. Uh, okay, it would be nice if you could put this uh, 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 in the stream at this point. Oh, how, I don't know how. I don't think I can do that, Joe. I don't uh, know how well, to do that. Um, I think if you put it, um, um, if you have it on your computer. Well, I can get it there. Okay, get it on your computer. Okay, and then uh try to share your screen and see what options okay it gives to you okay hold on one step at a time keep reading i'll get there okay uh as the deadline for action on the bill approaches um, newsom is under increasing pressure to step in and move the bill forward the Sacramento B, the Sacramento B editorial board published an editorial on January 21st, urging the governor to defy his industry allies and back uh, the uh, the legislation. "Quote: California's top elected official can help foster the statewide um, but discussion. He owes 40 million residents enduring a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic." along with the depredations of a profit-driven private um, healthcare sector, argued the editorial, which noted that an estimated 3.2 million Californians lacked health insurance and, quote, many more faced the uh, 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 crushing rigors of a private system that overcomplicates essential medical care and excessively charges patients for life-saving procedures and um, uh, um, uh, 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 prescriptions. Yes, they do excessively charge many, many thousands of dollars, Kay, as we all know. So um, um, I'm going to stop sharing that, but as part of the story, that story, okay, I want to bring up uh, what uh, what Ron uh, uh, Placon said just yesterday. He rightly um, pointed out that for people... Um, not to do what Ash Cholera just did and not to do, um, you know, what Anthony Rendon did, okay, a few years ago. There have to be consequences. There have to be consequences. It was clear when Rendon did what he did that he didn't think there were going to be any consequences. And there haven't been any consequences for Rendon. If anything, he's gotten stronger inside the party than he was then. But further, Colorado, when he talked to the press after he caved and he withdrew the bill, he seemed to feel somewhat guilty about um, um, actually withdrawing the bill. But people in talking to him got the clear impression Okay. And Ron Pacon, in a Zoom call he was on, got the, uh, the clear impression that even though he felt a little guilty about what he did and at some level was sorry for what he did, he also was quite clear about the idea 
that there would be no consequences for what he did. And yeah. Ron pointed out that if we want to stop this kind of thing, there must be consequences. So how do we develop those consequences? That is our problem, okay? As the voters want things and who are not getting those things. So Lisa? Yes, sir. Um, so what do you say to that, to the idea of consequences? Oh, I think that we, first of all, have to educate everybody on what is actually going on. And then the consequences are exactly what Amar, the chair of the Democratic Caucus, um, Progressive Dems in California, what he said, which is they're going to force them. They're not going to rubber stamp their endorsements. OK, in order to get party money. As they can, you know, to get the party endorsement, you have to get and then get the money. You have to be endorsed, which means you have to get the vote. OK, and what Amar has said is that they've already got a ground game going on. They're not going to auto endorse these, these uh, candidates and they're going to force them to the convention to have to have the vote at the convention. So at the convention, right, um, when you take something to a convention, you the delegates then are able to battle it out and you can you know at that point they are there are concessions that could be made i mean this is the same thing that bernie did when in 2016 where he can he, he said we're on to the convention right that's pretty much what omar said he, or omar i'm sorry omar 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 that's how he says his name omar he pretty much said we're going to the convention okay so then there was a uh a, a thread that he did that the party is withholding from the uh, caucus, or I think it's the caucus, withholding from the progressive gems, it must be the caucus, uh, the voting file, which is such horse manure. Like, I don't even know what that means specifically. Does that mean that they're not giving the voting files to all of the progressive gems in the party? I don't know. But in order to reach out to voters, to be able to communicate with the voters. Um, that's key, right? That's how you, those are your demographics, those are your super voters, those are who, who are registered Democrat, who are registered Republican, block by block, that's what those voter files are. That's how you contact people. Um, and so there's some shenanigans going on there. However, he said that they started working on this in December. So I'm not, you know, that would be another, I would have to have him back to talk about that. Uh, he did a Zoom call, uh, not last night, but the night before, with uh, Ash and a, the activists. And it was, it was a little candid from the snippets that I had seen. People were really, really angry, and they went at him. And Amar said that Ash has always been considered an ally. It was his bill. I almost called you Bernie, Joe. It was his bill, Joe. So, you know, this is one of those situations where, and we've talked about this before, the kind of pressure that you can put on these elected officials um, from a party, your own party, your own assembly, your, is enormous, right? I don't, I cannot possibly believe that Ash came to this decision lightly okay but he did say that it was a gamble and he felt that it was and it, this was pretty damning he said we felt that it was easier to um regain the trust of the activists or you know reinvigorate the activists rather than uh put the demo force the democrats to vote against their own constituents, which is such a lousy, and the way, even the way he said it, it was like, you know, you say things with conviction, or you say things because there's really nothing else you could say without blatantly lying, okay? So, you know, I'm not give, making excuses for these people. I'm also not stupid. I understand the kind of pressure 
that you have to withstand to go go against the entire party, your own party. It's his bill. He's you know he's busted his rear end for that thing. So has you know they're all very much in touch with the activists. I would not want, and nor would I ever put myself in this situation where I would have to sit there. I wouldn't sit there. You, I mean, I'm just, I don't have the temperament to deal with the bullshit, but it's real. It's real bullshit, guys. And it's heavy bullshit that those people are under. And it's not an excuse. It's just the reality of it. It really is. They all know what's going on. I have so much respect for Shargill for being able to come out and be so candid. And then later on, he subtweeted, um, he subtweeted Jason Call because Jason came out and said, this is the best interview. Oh, my God, this is such a good interview, something, something. And, <laughs> and uh, Shagiel subtweeted him and said, yeah, I, have, I don't have any more fucks to give. Like, you know, like, I don't yeah, get I saw that. I saw that. I don't have beautiful. any more fucks to give. That's great. It was just beautiful. You know, it's, you could tell he's just had it. I mean, imagine how fed up you would have to be to come right out and say so eloquently, so easily, so like almost like it was just getting it off his chest. Like this is what's going on, folks, and we're going to force these these candidates. They want to if they want to take big money, they want to vote through their special interests. That's fine, but we're not going to let the party wash your money. We're going to make you go and take the money because they can't get them to vote. It's the same thing going up on in on Capitol Hill. None of these politicians will, will vote on anything. They put them all in these massive bills, which that was a good idea, by the way. Trying to get something through reconciliation, thinking that it was going to be able to happen, was a good idea. Okay, it really was because if it could have happened, that would have been terrific. The problem is that they whittled it down and whittled it down and played stupid games and la 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 all the while out of the other side of their mouth. This is Joe Biden's agenda. This is his agenda. Blah, blah, blah. The rotating villain. For him to be able to come out and just say same thing that is going on in Capitol Hill. He didn't say that. But point out to all of us. It's happening everywhere. And I think that that is really important because people know what's happening on Capitol Hill. At least people who are in the know that we have watching this show and we deal with on a regular and consistent basis. We'd love to break out of the algorithms and have lots of people watch this so that they can learn what we already knew. But it's another thing entirely to have it brought to you by the chair of one of the caucuses, in this case, the Progressive Caucus on the Dem side of the House, to sit down and literally say to you, this is going on here too, folks. It's been going on forever. The party is cleaning money so that the candidates don't have to say they are taking big money. So he's like, yeah, we're going to force them because the other side of it is you can't even look up how they voted on these bills because they're not forcing them to vote on them. Yes. They're just pulling them. Yes. Uh, your interview um, has had a particular effect um, um, on me uh, because when I talk about uh, um, uh, dumping the incumbents, okay, I had been talking about the PACs, the rich people, okay, and the corporations. And to that, I now add the party committees. Can't take any money from the party committees either. If you do, you're going to get dumped. So, By the way, super PACs can't donate money to campaigns. Oh, I know they can't. I know they well, can't. Well, there's a. I've been told today that somehow I'm responsible for educating people on what a super PAC is and what a super PAC isn't, which I do not feel that's my job. My job is to get the money into that PAC so we can fund these initiatives, and that's how I'm going to spend my time. But since we're on the subject, super PACs since we're on the cannot subject. donate to candidates, period, the end. Okay, I've said my piece. Yes, right. And if, if they do, their status as independent expenditure, um, um, 
independent expenditure only committees can be lifted. Oh, it would, would be. They'd shut it down in a heartbeat. You can't do it. Yes, yes, you can't do it. Uh, but you can walk up to the line pretty good. In the Nina Turner, Chantel Brown race, uh, the Super PAC, um, how that opposed her, uh, wasn't able to give any direct money to Chantel Brown. However, Chantel Brown was able to put these ads up in the paper and surround the ads with a red border so the Super PAC could see what Chantel Brown's uh, strategy was. She was communicating with them in that way. And then they would simply reinforce what she was saying. That was their strategy. Okay. And that had a pretty devastating effect in the final days of that particular campaign. Okay. But of course, that's not so much a problem with super PACs uh, themselves. Okay. It's a problem with the FEC not clamping down on Chantel Brown who was obviously uh, involved, okay, in illegal communications or guidance of that particular super PAC. Oh, I got news for you. I've been on the inside of these PACs, not super PACs, but on these PACs. Okay. People don't even know what PACs, who's a PAC and who is not, by the way. But the, which is one of the reasons why we came out so forthright with what we were doing. Uh, for anyone who, you know, thinks that whatever we're doing is so uh, absolutely heinous. Um, transparency is what we were doing. Anyhow, um, these so-called PACs that nobody knows are PACs because they don't tell you they're PACs. Uh, you know, they're not supposed to coordinate with candidates. They're not supposed to work with candidates. They're not supposed to ever contact candidates. <laughs> they do. They absolutely do. And there's no one pulling their tax status and auditing how they're, how they're communicating or going about anything. Because both parties are in on uh, the game, mm -hmm. and the FEC is in on the game, and they won't enforce the law. I mean, the law well, is it's, it's deregulation, it. right? Well, they're, not, they're not going after this stuff. And there's, they're not. Because basically what that means is they're not enforcing the laws. You don't have to overturn a law to have deregulation, folks. You just gut the internal. You put a secretary on top of the regulatory agency and nothing happens. Right. And uh, the neoliberals have been doing that now for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why the country is in such a mess. Yep. They're not enforcing uh, the laws. Okay. okay, so let's go on to the next piece. Wait, did I answer your question? What was the question? The pressure. How do you apply the pressure? So it was. Yeah. How do you generate consequences? And Brandy points out Lisa's interview was retweeted by Susan Sarandon. Uh, yes. So cool. I love it. She does that once in a while. She'll come around the Red Berets. She's usually, she never retweeted anything of mine before, but she grabs Laura once in a while. Yeah, but once she retweeted that, all of a sudden, there were lots more views, and you could see it happening. You know, oh, this minute, there was 1,900. Two minutes from then, there was 2,100. Two minutes from then, it was 2,500. And so on, just up and up and up and up, following her retweet. Pretty. It's pretty. And you know what? And oh, are pretty. they mad at her? Because she retweeted from my timeline. So I'm seeing all of the, like, all the shit libs losing their minds, right? And they lose their minds on her anyway. But then they watch that, and they're just like, their heads are exploding. It's so, it's so fun. I mean, I really needed that. I really needed to smile today. It was just like, oh, my gosh. Look at, look at you people. Look at how bad this is. It's really, it's something. It is something. It is something. So the next piece, I think it's interesting, too. It's not a long piece. It's a brief piece 
from the Peterson Foundation. The Peterson Foundation notes, oh, here it's in, good. Not always in when it's supposed to be in. This is on January 28, 2022. Healthcare spending reaches a record high. The COVID-19 pandemic temporarily drove healthcare spending to a record high in 2020. I'll bet it's also been high in 2021, according to official estimates from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Healthcare costs surged to 4.1 trillion, or nearly 20% of gross domestic product in 2020. I have to say, I think that percentage is a little bit of an exaggeration because if I remember correctly, by the end of 2020, GDP was maybe 22 to 23 trillion and 4.1 trillion, of course, corresponds to a GDP of 20 trillion. So, uh, but anyway, they wanted to emphasize how much is being spent on healthcare so they took on the figure of nearly 20 percent they might tell me they they actually explain why that is because if they didn't i'm gonna i'm gonna not like this place uh, well they said uh, the pandemic temporarily drove healthcare spending to a record high okay in 2020 yeah because everybody had COVID, and the government picked up the tab for the treatment did they say that in here it was government funded uh yes they do okay. say that in here they do say that it was government funded. They have, of course, this graph about uh, how the expenditures went up from 17% to 20% in uh, 2020. The rise in healthcare spending was largely driven by the federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which included assistance to healthcare providers right. and expansion of federal activities that were related to public health and an increase in federal support um, for Medicaid. Due to and such COBRA, the subsidies for COBRA came oh, out. I of recall it. those too. Those were very important. Very yeah, important. I mean, they're talking about the money that they printed that went not, didn't go to anybody who, you know, needed food or, you know, to be able to pay their electric bills or pay their rent or, you know, anything like that, it went to COBRA subsidies, right? And if then, it goes to COBRA subsidies, it's going to the insurance companies. Exactly. And then they're, you know, and then the government printed money for them under the emergency, uh, whatever you wanted to call it, CARES Act or what, I don't know if it was in the CARES Act or one of the other ones, but the government uh, printed uh, that money. Actually, I think it was in the CARES Act, yes. Yeah, so... And then the other flip side of this, Joe, is that are, there were a lot of uh, way more people who didn't consume health health care in those these pandemic years because they had to put it off. They were either you know elderly, didn't want to go outside. We all know the stories. They were waiting for the vaccine. The first two rounds of uh, the, the first uh, virus and then the, the first big variant that, that ripped through here. You know, the reason that the elderly were able to uh, sustain themselves is that they got smart quick. They were the first ones to get the vaccines. They knew that they were going to be susceptible. They stayed at home way more often than anybody else. They were very, very uh, conscious of wearing their masks. They had to. They were at higher risk, right? And yes. then the rest of the community, you know, if you needed your knees replaced, well, that sure as hell didn't happen. None of that kind of care, um, even people who, you know, needed angioplasty and stents and all of that kind of stuff, sat, sat yes, for a sat. long time, um, not consuming. And waited. Uh, we, okay, of course, are elderly, and we did exactly that. We stayed home. We were careful. We were cautious. We only went out when we had to go out. We wore our masks. We waited for the vaccines. As soon as we could get them, we got them. We got the second shot. As soon as we could get it, we got the booster shots. 
soon, okay, as we could get it. But we're still careful. Even mm -hmm. now, we don't think that gives us any kind of complete immunity. And we want to live a much longer time. Right. So it, as, a, as a personal uh, awareness, right? And you wouldn't go and have your friends in your complex come over and you know hang out in your house and play cards because you know that not only is that you that is at risk it's them right absolutely, I mean, absolutely. and when you live in that world where you understand that it you know as an older person you get this you're way, way, way more susceptible to as bad as it gets, right? And you can not only protect yourself, you protect your friends, right? Yep. I mean, containment, that is containment. Your actions are containment, right? Uh, yeah, you want to protect your friends and you want to protect your family. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you don't see your family. In these two years, maybe we've seen our grandkids twice. Which is really, it's heartbreaking, right? But but you don't want your grandkids, you know, I mean, let's just say that you want to see your grandkids. I mean, I had, we had my, my husband's mother coming here. We haven't seen her in two years. And my my son came home with a fever. And we were like, okay. We called, we called, we called them and said, look, don't come. Don't yeah. come. Too dangerous. Too dangerous. Yeah. So anyway, all of that said. All of that said. All of sad that, all that said, let's go back to mm -hmm. the Peterson Foundation. Uh, okay. The government, spending by the government increased in 2020 increased by 36% in 2020, six times higher than the 5.9% growth in 2019. What's more, that federal aid actually offset the slow or negative growth of spending through private health insurance gay or out-of-pocket payments, both of which were lower than previous years due to lower usage of healthcare goods and services during the pandemic. In fact, without the boost in federal assistance, Healthcare costs would only have grown by about 2% in 2020, much lower than the average uh, annual growth rate of 4.2% over the last uh, uh, decade. And they have a nice little graph here showing how uh, there's been a major surge in federal government spending compared to households, private businesses, state and local governments, and other private revenues. Uh, okay, I guess I have to point out here that this shows federal government spending as only one point uh, uh, five trillion dollars, but it doesn't account for federal spending in the way some others have accounted for it. For example, a few years ago, um, uh, Himmelstein and Wilhandler did a serious study of the amount of healthcare spending that is actually done by the federal government in terms of its aids to insurance companies, um, um, aid to hospitals and supporting facilities, okay, various kinds, uh, aid to state and local governments. Uh, they found at that time, this was somewhere around 2017, okay, I have the article, they found that actual federal government expenditures on health care at that time were 2.5 trillion dollars out of roughly three and a half trillion dollars okay that the federal government was spending total total yes so more more than two-thirds of total spending on health care in the year i guess it's 2017 they studied more than two thirds was being spent by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that just uh, should be noted. By the way, that's true now too. More than two thirds is actually spent by the federal government, 
of that total they were citing of $4.1 trillion, might even be higher than two-thirds now. Well, does that, does that take into account the household spending? Uh, the total? Uh, the household spending that comes from the households, of course, is not uh, but, uh, but, um, um, but direct spending by the federal government. No, now, no, no. But that household figure, that spending, that household figure spending here, is that like premium, or is that does that include the surprise bills? Like, what is they? How could they possibly aggregate? Okay, I think everything. This, okay, I don't know what the Peterson Foundation actually did. Okay, to do that, there are different ways that healthcare spending, okay, is categorized, okay, and classified by CMS. The source here was actually CMS, but the way they aggregated um, into these categories is much different, okay, from the way that the spending was aggregated by uh, the study, okay, of Himmelstein, okay, and Wilhamper. They were using CMS as their primary source, too. And, of but course... CMS is only... It's only your Medicare and Medicaid, CMS is, and disability, you know, anybody who's covered with all that. Oh, that yeah. Doesn't... What CMS tracks is total spending on health care from all sources. So then like, they must be they going to the Commonwealth. Every year. That $4.1 must... $4. trillion they cited for 2020, that well, is wait, a CMS wait. total of health care spending in the United States. So it includes the private spending, it includes the insurance spending, it includes the government spending, it includes spending by state and local government, it includes all those uh, sources. Well, where are they getting the data from? The Commonwealth? Uh, um, I'm assuming that they're getting a lot of the data from surveys that uh, CMS uh, uh, conducts. Well, surveys aren't reliable. They would have to be getting hard data. And I know that all that hard data goes to the Commonwealth. CMS does not have the capability to track all this spending. They're getting that data from the Commonwealth. They would have to. It doesn't make uh, sense. Well, when you say they're getting that data from the Commonwealth, you're talking about the Commonwealth um, the fund? No, there's a mass data aggregate that is um, all of the electronic medical record system have, uh, what do they call it? Something use. What's the tech term for uh, data usage, which means, oh shoot. Anyhow, it is built into the submission codes of your billing that oh. that information goes to a big conglomerate that is used to be called the Commonwealth, Commonwealth, and all of those, all of those, uh, all that information goes to one big place up in the sky, and I never quite understood who owned it. I asked the question at the uh, conference, and and you could hear a pin drop in the room. Anyway, <laughs> um, the. Uh, <laughs> That's all there, okay? They, they, it is aggregated somewhere. I can't. I tried to get them to explain to me who owned it. Nobody wanted to say. And finally, I just said, okay, does the government own it? Who owns it, right? So there is a data aggregate. It's like everybody's data goes into one big hole, okay? Nobody seems to want to talk about who owns that or, you know, how that how that is used, but they do aggregate it. But I can't, this CMS doesn't aggregate all this data, so they must be getting it from somewhere. But anyhow, because surveys aren't reliable, Joe, they're just not. I throw them away. Okay, well, of course, I think it depends on the survey and the size of the sample, mm -mm. all kinds nope. of different things on surveys. In other words, um, the surveys done by the Census Bureau are pretty good. Yeah, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time with CMS. I mean, in order for them to aggregate all of this data, uh, people would well, have what to you're know. having a hard time with uh, with CMS about, I guess, is knowing what the actual source of the CMS data is, right? Correct. I want to know what it is. Okay. So let's go find that out. Okay, the two of us. 
Okay, let's go do the best we can to find out. Not now, right? We'll do it and come back later. Yeah, not right now, okay, in okay. the middle of the live stream, no. But it's, okay. it's something that we both ought to look into. Well, I used to have access to the CMS aggregate database because I was that was my role, right? So there's a lot of data out in CMS that I have dug through. Um, but it was aggregated through CMS claims. So, you know, I've been out of that that uh, I've been out of that realm for a couple of years now. So something might have changed. Things are changing every day. But CMS is not a they have data on the people that whose claims come through and are are adjudicated through CMS, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, they're not going to have they themselves are not, at least they didn't a couple of years ago, didn't have aggregated data, hard data, not survey data, which is extrapolation and population. And I can get into that all. That's all crap. Hard data is what I would hope they are using to say that they're spending this kind of money. This, you know, I mean, four point. Two trillion dollars. Okay, there's a lot of play in that number. It's huge. But to your point, Joe, there's a hell of a lot more money being spent on healthcare than 4.2 million dollars. And I could get into it, but I'm not gonna. Well, you mean then the 4.2 trillion dollars? You think it's even more? Oh, I guarantee you, it's more. Okay, we've got to find, um, but um, but those particular data sources, because if it's five trillion or six trillion a year. That's a very significant thing that we got to find out about. Well, here's here's what I'm trying to get at, Joe. If you're talking about health care, right? Well, what does that mean? Money spent on health care. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean the, the claims that are coming through billing from providers and getting processed? Or does that mean everything that goes into running health care? In this country, uh, what I think it is okay is the latter. Okay, okay. so uh, then I promise the, you, uh, 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 the Himmelstein and Will Handler study covered such things as spending on healthcare facilities. What about all the tech? Spending on the tech. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it goes from there. It just keeps going, Joe. It keeps going. Because in a facility, let's just talk about that. Like doing the laundry, everybody has laundry services that is shipped out and brought back. I mean, I could go through line item by line item by line item. It is phenomenal how and, this, this keeps I'm going to send you a copy of uh, the study, uh, you know, by Himmelstein, okay, and Will Handler. Okay. Uh, I think it'll be very interesting for you. Okay, even before the pandemic, the growing share of U.S. healthcare costs was covered by government health programs uh, uh, such as Medicare and Medicaid, okay, presenting a strain on the U.S. fiscal picture. Now we're starting to get into what the Peterson Foundation always worries about, the fiscal picture of the United States. And the United States always already spent significantly more on healthcare than other developed countries, often with worse um, outcomes. The, the pandemic has presented a devastating and unique challenge okay, to the U.S. healthcare system. And as a result, our fiscal condition as well, exacerbating an existing unsustainable outlook. That's the constant message of the Peterson Foundation that our government spending is unsustainable. So they told this story about the increase in healthcare spending. Why is it unsustainable? Uh, they think it's unsustainable because they believe that the sources of federal revenue are taxing and borrowing. Oh, for God's sake. Really? And nothing else. They've been telling these lies now since the formation of the Peterson Foundation in 2008. And okay, I'm going to go get I'm going to go get something to drink so I can specifically the MMTers have been arguing with them, arguing with them since their foundation was formed. Every single year, we all argue with them. 
you know, this is the kind of stuff that we need to just start doing is calling out. Like, I mean, give me a markup pen. Let's just mark this stuff up and send the articles out. It, everybody needs to start highlighting the bullshit in these articles and then sending them out. Yeah, bullshit. because uh, this kind of organization goes to the Congress testifies before the committees. That's what I took. Remember I said to you, we want to watch this and we want to start having MMTers critique the crap that's said in committee hearings. Yes, well, um, um, as I said, we have been doing that um, in committee meetings for some time and we have been fighting the Peterson Foundation for some time, calling them out. I'm talking some- about our media. We as independent media... And it would be great if we could get one of the big MM tiers every time there's a big hearing where people are testifying to like do a retort or calling out all this crap. Somebody that everybody would watch. Because if we started doing that, even if we did that for maybe, I don't know, a month or any time a big committee meeting was coming up, it would get attention. It would get attention. People would listen. We have to make that proposal to uh, the MNTs, okay, specifically yes. the ones who have names that people mm-hmm. are now starting uh, to uh, to recognize. Mm-hmm. There are probably mm-hmm. only three or four such people, uh, but even now, uh, you know, an MMT is starting to hit uh, 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 the mainstream, but. Uh, but, you know, someone like a Bill Mitchell, who is famous, mm-hmm. um, you know, in MMT circles as one of the fathers, uh, you know, of MMT. And he's one of the co-authors of the major textbook. He was actually the senior author, um, you know, the major textbook. Yeah. The only textbook, actually. He's largely Large. unknown to the public. Largely Large. unknown. No, you know, it's, it takes, I think. Here's what I'm going to say. Let's just say in a perfect world, Bill Mitchell would want to do this. Um, You know, when you pick and choose, the little hearings that don't get a lot of attention, you know, they happen all the time. But the big ones, the big ones where you get these people who get up and start pontificating about how your tax dollars and blah, 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 la, 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 la. And they get, you know, 200,000 views. Those are the ones. Like we could get them, you know, MMT committee, uh, you know, the MMT rebuttal to the, you know, whatever it is, committee hearing on blah, blah, blah. That would be really good because nobody's doing that. Not on a public facing, big public facing retort. We do it. We do it here. We have our little, you know, we're going to talk about this. Come watch us do this. We've got to get real. Got to get loud, and we've got to get real. Well, we got to figure out how to get them loud, okay, and real. They can get real. That no, I mean we got to start. We got to take the fight. But really, them. The only MMT who has a very loud voice right now is Steph. Yeah, but I don't see. I don't know. She does. I mean, she's got this. Let's put it this way. She's got the spotlight. Okay, people know her. She's she's out there. But when it comes to combating uh what what was the guy what was the guy who came out and did the ridiculous uh takedown of Build Back Better? He's a Republican, he's in the house. I want to say Roy or Croy. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? He got up and he made all the all the stupid lies or either that or he's just a damned idiot about how the economy works and how, you know, oh, we don't have money for this and this is going to balloon the debt. And yeah, oh, it was just all the usual crap, right? All the usual crap, yes. So when you've got somebody that, that, you know, I don't know, verbose and gross with their rhetoric, right? It would be really cool. To have somebody like mild-mannered Warren to, you know, 
rebut it. Or L. Randall Ray seems really, really cool when he, you know, very intelligently kind of makes fun of people retorting things, right? I mean, that would be really yeah, cool. He can do a great job. He huh? Can do a great, he can do a great job. And Stephanie can too. It's just that, you know, it depends on the person doing the presentation as to, you know, there's just better personalities to do retorts, right? And if they would all be willing to start doing that instead of everybody on mainstream TV, uh, you know, lights, camera, bullshit, start talking about, oh, we can't afford this, you know? Okay, well, from I mean, the standpoint of, you know, of making a retort and making it a cutting retort and making it uh, sharp okay, and very pointed, the best person for that in the MMT group anyway, okay, is Randy. Well, I kind of agree with you, but I mean, it's not, doesn't mean that they can't all do it. Uh, right, but okay, in Warren's case, uh, okay, it seems to me he's very good. I mean, I love his work. I do too. I first learned uh, um, 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 you know, my MMT. Oh, he's got, oh, excuse me, hold on a second, Joe. I got to put you on here. Yeah. Sorry, we've got uh, the school changing. They were going to be closed tomorrow, and now they're not. So everything around here is changing. God, okay. Uh, so Warren, uh, when he gives his pitch, he tends to be friendly about it, okay, and funny about it, okay, and entertaining about it. He isn't really cutting about it. I think Stephanie has, in a way, a similar style, but she is really extremely crystal clear about it. But it's not in her personality to be cutting mm -hmm. either. I agree. I and agree. For this kind of retort, we need somebody cutting. Sharp tongued. Sharp tongued. And poignant. Yes. And that is Randy. I, I kind of agree. I agree. Not kind of. I agree. So now we have to talk him into it. And now we have to talk him into it. We'll figure it out. But we have to get him a platform that would get him lots and lots of okay, views. And that's, our, that too. that's not our problem. We're not. Uh, that's our problem. We're not sufficiently large yet to get him those kinds, okay, of views. And we need to be. We really do need to be. Well, I mean, it's not, you know, there are things that you do that will help make your viewership large. I know. Okay? I know. So, I, you know, that's a chicken and egg thing. We don't wait until we're huge to ask if we think that might be a good idea. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we can't share it with everybody, you know. I mean, there's, I agree. I completely I mean, this is public purpose, right? Really. Right. For real, and it needs to happen now because we've got election cycles coming up. If they'd be willing to do it, and they don't have to do it until then, though, I think it's important that maybe we do it. Somebody's got to do it, and we'll get it circulated. Well, we can certainly start doing it. Uh, there are two of my books that you haven't seen yet. Okay, okay. both of those are about the Peterson Foundation. Okay, two whole books on the Peterson Foundation. Okay, and uh, when you're ready for those two whole books, I can certainly send them to you. Just uh, give me the high sign. Okay, I'll be happy to send them to you. <laughs> okay, because I'm, I'm, just, I'm just dripping with extra time right now. But anyhow, yeah, I would love I know, to see them. I know you're dripping with extra time, but you're talking about something. Uh, no, when, I'm Joe, I'm very, very used to reading for content. I know how to get the gems of what I'm looking for out of stuff at this point. I've been doing it for so long with, with, with you know, that's what you do when you're in, when you're, you know, compliance and regulations and all of that. And I, I, I personally love to read books in their entirety. You know, I'm one of those people that highlights and puts sticky notes on books. I'm just, I love to read that way. Um, 
I don't have that luxury right now, and I don't see my life going in a place where I'm going to have that kind of time. So please send them because I will use them and use them and use them because this oh. is about healthcare. So it's perfect. Okay, I will I will certainly send those books. They're not about healthcare per se. No, what but this about is the role of the Peterson uh, uh, Foundation within um, our political system, which is actually dramatically large, and their role in spreading the propaganda that we are going broke or we yeah. can go broke, that we so that can be unsustainable. So I wrote those two books on that stuff actually related to the Peterson uh, the Foundation specifically. How long, how long ago did you write them? I wrote those books in 2016, actually. Okay, that's really not that long ago, Joe. No, it isn't that long ago. No, in yeah, fact, okay. um, I was writing then. When I have some time and I sit down to write, I write real, real fast. I wrote six books in seven months. Look at you. At that point. That's something I can do. Of course, I don't know if I can still do it. I did it back in 2016. It's 2022 now. I'm a little older. And you, know? you seem like you've got your, your, you're pretty sharp there, Joe. I, I, my money's on you. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so uh, okay, the Peterson Foundation is all about um, leading into the unsustainability. And while here they have this little article on healthcare, when you look uh, on the side, you see a number of links to various things like the CBO's budget outlook shows pandemic's acceleration of U.S. fiscal challenges. Can't we flag that for misinformation? Uh, like anytime, anytime you see the CBO, you can, can we flag it? Like <laughs> they flag everything else. Uh, yes, the CBO provides misinformation. They provide fake news because the assumption of the assumptions they make, which are false assumptions. You know, Joe, and in it, love with the Peterson Foundation. Is it One because of the ones on the inside? Is it because of their indoctrination into the into the neoclassical economic lens? Uh, the uh, the neoliberal economic lens. Whatever um, it is, Peter G. Peterson. Oh, was the instrumental person in spreading the neoliberal doctrines uh, from, I don't know, 1970 until he died. I mean, he was there at the beginning. He was doing it uh, constantly uh, uh, inside of New York circles and D.C. circles. And he indoctrinated those circles with the idea, okay, of unsustainability. And when he made a killing uh, in the market in the early 2000s and acquired a fortune of five point uh, 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 five point five billion dollars, he devoted one trillion dollars of it to setting up this Peter G. Peterson Foundation. He made five trillion dollars in the market. Five point five trillion dollars, yes. Okay, in the market. What did uh, he do over he what period of time? Uh, well, it was mostly just a few years in the early 2000s, as you know, as part of the boom. Um, he was always a rich man, but he got to be a billionaire in the period 2000 to 2008, okay, I guess, just those eight years. And he made no. like, uh, you know, five point uh, uh, um, five billion dollars with, I forget whether it was BlackRock or Blackstone. Uh, you know, it, was it sort had of to money. be, it had to be, yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. But then he took a trillion of it, and he sunk it into this uh, foundation, which his son, okay, is running now because he died a couple of years ago. 
But, what I'm you know, trying to get at, though, Joe, is do they actually know that what they're saying is crap? They've got to know it. They, yeah, they've got to know it. There's a lot of people, Joe, that just don't. They but just don't. they've got to know it because Mosler was talking to one of the central figures um, in their network as early as 2003. The guy was the controller of the currency, okay, at that time. And Warren went to talk to him, and, you know, he outlined MMT to the guy. So the guy was aware of MMT back then, and, uh, you know, he must have run to Peterson and his group uh, um, you know, to tell them about it. So at some level, they've been aware of it for a very long time. Now, in 2010, they had their big fiscal summits, and they were in league, okay, with the uh, uh, the administration then, you know, the Obama administration. He got money from uh, the Peterson uh, 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 Foundation to fund the fiscal commission the government ran, okay, at that time. Okay, there was no... This is just just all overt oppression and austerity then. Because that's that's what this yields. The neoliberal economic, uh, you know, spin yields austerity. Yeah, one of the authors of the Washington Consensus, one of the main figures in creating the Washington um, Consensus that spread over the whole world, and has been enormous trouble for the developing countries, was Peter G. Peterson. Uh, The first report that stated explicitly the Washington Consensus came out of the foundation that Peter G. Peterson was the head of at that time. He was there. At the start, he was there at the height, okay, of the neoliberal spread all over the world. Yeah. Um, He's an evil guy in some ways. He knew what he was doing. They're all just making money on cheap, desperate labor. Yep. So, if you look at all these links um, over on the side, sooner or later, you get to the current federal deficit, okay, in debt. And you click on that, and the current federal deficit and debt. Every month, the U.S. Treasury releases data on the federal budget, the monthly data. The federal government ran a budget deficit the first three months of fiscal year 2022. Look at the size of those deficits. Now, I don't know what they're saying now because Mike Norman says that so far in 2022, not in fiscal year 2022, but in calendar year 2022, which is the second quarter of fiscal 2022, uh, the government has been running a surplus. And Mike Norman. Oh, wow. Can you feel that surplus? is worried about that um, surplus because he knows that a surplus, uh, he knows that when the government actually runs a surplus, that surplus is money taken out of the non-government economy. He knows that. Okay. And they think big surpluses now, the Biden administration for... January, February, and March. The whole Please, help me. whole first quarter. This is where the inflation is. Oh, God, I want to just scream. Uh, the federal budget deficit for December 2021 was $21 billion for December 2020. was $144 billion. Uh, they talk about the cumulative uh, uh, by federal deficit. They're just giving you all these numbers and statistics and the whole Does that make sense to me, Joe. Just for a second, let me just say this. When you run a surplus, you're taking capital out of circulation. Right? You taking are money. you are literally destroying those dollars. 
You're right. taxing yeah. more than you're spending. Mm -hmm. Tax revenue is destroyed by the Federal Reserve in settlement of the tax deposits. You are right. literally, therefore, destroying the money. Right, right. So, so let's stick with me here. So when there's less in circulation, right, we all know that us, us on the bottom of this, you know, food chain hanging out here in the micro where nobody pays any damned attention at the top of the house, right? Yeah. So you've got these corporations now, and when you are pulling money out of circulation, they then they can't leverage as easily, right? They've got they've got capital, they've got cash flow potential problems because sometimes they sell their receivables. It just depends. When but that contributes. Uh, when you drag the money out, uh, but take it out of the um, economy by destroying the money, sooner or later you get um, um, actually liquidity crises right. occurring in the financial system. Right, exactly. So this is also another reason, maybe, why, not maybe, I know this, why companies can somehow feel that it is appropriate because they don't want to miss what they've called to the street, right? And we're, we're projecting this. Oh, wait a minute. We're, get, we, we're in a liquidity thing here. Things aren't as easy. Flow is not going as quickly. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, we're going to raise some prices. Because they're never going to stop or admit that they're going to have a profit decline, Joe. Nobody likes to do that. They'll claw at anything before they will ever even stagnate month, quarter over quarter, right? They don't even like to do that. So this is this is another aggregator of oh okay liquidity things aren't flowing as easily it's a little harder to do x y and z as a company well i'm just going to raise some prices okay here's the favorite thing they like to do they have the national debt clock oh and then they get tell you how much of it belongs to you yes ninety thousand two hundred and forty three now that's just a plain lie none of it belongs to you Jesus, amen. That you know, debt was incurred by the federal government. The federal government has the constitutional power to create that money as it falls due. It is a debt of the federal government. You are not of the federal government. Yeah, I mean, my God, this is such horseshit. And it's assets on the corporate books, for Christ's sake. Oh, you know, this is so awful. It's awful. The thirty, trillion, the thirty trillion odd dollars. That's money that the federal government has not taken from the non-government um, in taxes. So that is thirty where, trillion is good for the non-government. It's good for the corporations, Joe. Say it. This is corporate banking assets. It, it, uh, there's a lot of it that's corporate banking assets, but the assets that are in households also have not been taken by the federal government yet in taxation. That's part of the thirty trillion. Oh, I don't know anybody who hasn't been hasn't gotten an extra couple of tax bills over the last two years. I know we did. Well, sure, there are extra tax bills, but what I'm saying is. Uh, the thirty million, okay, in debt. Those are treasury issues. True. That have not been uh, redeemed yet by the federal mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. So more the financial assets that are out there that have not been taxed away by the federal government yet. Yeah. So that's good. Well, it is good in one sense, Joe, but it's not good in another because where's all where who got out of paying taxes? Uh, it may not be good because of the distribution right. of that thirty trillion dollars that's exactly. out. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. I completely agree. 
but the $30 trillion as a figure is far better than if that $30 trillion was at zero. Well, yeah, of course, but that's, that's academic. I mean, that's like elementary academic to try to get people to understand, right? We need to run deficits. Of course we do, because when you run surpluses, Things go to hell in a handbasket. You need the money in circulation. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. You're taking it out, okay, of the economy. So these people try to scare you continuously with the size of the debt. Okay? And then they're saying, and then Obama it's your debt. Uh, well, Obama. Crying, it's your debt. It's 90000 for every single person in America. Yeah, right. And they because... say when a baby is born, it owes 90000 I wish the ninety thousand of that. I mean that uh, number because sorry. if that if that was if that was if Joe just for a second, okay? If every person in the United States put that back up, put that back up, slide this back down, stop. If every person in the United States, if my household had government backed securities of ninety thousand two hundred and forty three dollars, if this household owned those securities. It was part of this debt number up top here. We wish we owned $90,243 worth of government-backed securities because that would be the asset, the debt's up top. Yeah, right. But see, the bottom line here is they're saying here that that $90,243 is the responsibility, okay, of each, okay, and every American. But it's not. Of course, but it's so not. Of course, because each times. and every American never contracted that debt. The federal government pays <laughs> that debt off. That debt. But it's a lesson, Joe. It is a way to teach, right? Yes. I would, if I were teaching the accounting class, elementary accounting, right? The debt is this 30 trillion bucks. Okay? And that means that if every person in the United States held the asset, which was a piece of the debt, every person in the United States would have $90,243 of government-backed security. Right. That's what this means. If you were lucky enough to have $90,243 worth of government-backed security, you don't. All right, but what the uh, Peterson Foundation is trying to do is to turn it around and say, but see, you people out there are going to have to pay back that $90,243 that the government has borrowed. Oh, Joe, I don't need to make another enemy. I don't want to have to spend my time beating these people up. I've got enough enemies right now. <laughs> well, as you said earlier uh, in the broadcast, we got to keep on beating these people up because they yeah, are. Yeah, but these people are nasty. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that yet. That's why we need that's why we need the MMTers to start rebuking some of this, rebuking some of this stuff publicly when it happens. Not this, because this is out there in print. I'm talking about when politicians and federal appointees and secretaries get up and, you know, testify or make some speech. They got to come right out and talk about how ridiculous it is. Right. Okay. So we are running out of time. Okay. At the present, uh, we now have a choice of going to the comments and taking those. Uh, the remaining article was something that I know you're very interested in. And that article was... <laughs> What happened to my article here? Why are fossil the Marxist? Oh, here it is. Why are fossil fuel firms and Senate Republicans so afraid of Sarah uh, uh, the Bloom Raskin? And I know you have an interest in Sarah Bloom Raskin. I do. Okay, I but do I don't much. think we have the time to go over this article. Oh, you're you're, you're teasing. Uh, Not no, fair. Uh, but no, I'm not actually teasing. It's 1039, and we got roughly 21 minutes left, and this is probably a longer article than that. But what we can do is this. We can hold this article for the next uh, in-depth show uh, uh, next Wednesday, and we can go over it then. 
Wait a minute. Uh, Isn't Wednesday Democracy Hangs in the Balance? So Tuesday would be? Uh, or am no. I wrong? Tuesday is Democracy Hangs in the Balance. Are you changing days on me? I am not changing days on you, Lisa. I Some, I, my brain is then. <laughs> if you check, if you check what happened uh, by this week, when did Sherry Wise come on the program? What day was that? <laughs> I don't remember, Joe. It's all running that together. That was Tuesday. Okay. That was Tuesday. And was that Sherry the day that I interviewed? Was that the day of the interview that I did or not? Or was the interview? It had to be Tuesday. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it was. It was. It was. That's why I don't remember. Because I was late. I was late coming in. Yes, you were okay. late coming in, but you weren't late coming in because you did the interview then. No, I was late coming in because I had another meeting. Right, that's what I thought. Right, it was, yeah, I know what the other meeting was. Yep, yep. Okay, so uh, okay, I think we should go over and look at what people um, had to say. Okay, and pick up some of the comments anyway. Of course, people uh, were very angry about uh, the California thing. Carmen is here tonight. I haven't seen Carmen in a while. Hi, Carmen. Yeah, Carmen has had a tough time actually getting on the internet. Oh. And that's why um, you know she has not been able to be here. But uh, she sends me things to review, uh, I don't know, maybe four or five times a week. Uh, you know, I'm getting notes from her about this article that's appeared, you know, and that article appeared. So she keeps in touch. But, uh, you know, she's been having to go to libraries, uh, you know, to get to the Internet. And I think tonight she has some special deal going where she's got some really good Internet. So, of course, we are very um, happy to see her. She's very gracious, both to Bonnie, okay, and myself, okay, in her notes. And we really appreciate them. And we really appreciate her. Yeah, it's good to see her. Um, Evelina says, Newsom is a nuisance, as far as I can tell, not being from California myself. He's worse than a nuisance. He's not one who managed uh, COVID very well. So he was also about people dying on his watch. Well, wait till he runs for president, guys. Yeah, and we have the wonderful choice of Gavin Newsom or Donald Trump or maybe Ron DeSantis, otherwise known as Death Santis for people who come from, uh, from Florida. In fact, I think it was Carmen who first... Wait a minute, Bill Bradley. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, don't, I don't think that's a basketball player, Bill Bradley. No, that's not what I was thinking. I've seen him before, but it's been a while. And Brandy says uh, Sarandon uh, stands up for a lot of issues that will help poor people more than the middle class. Yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. She's a really good person. Carmen says Newsom can open jobs in the green industry instead. Isn't that in the state um, um, allocated um, infrastructure funding via the federal government? Well, there's a little green industry there, but mainly that's a giveaway to the donors, uh, the infrastructure bill that they passed. Oh, yeah. It's, it's really totally corrupt in terms of um, um, how it works, Carmen. Yeah, a few people will get some jobs out of it. They For a minute, a no. couple years at the most. Yeah, Carmen says dump that incumbent. Then Dolores says dump the incumbents now. Ah, we got a number of dump the incumbents fans here. Steve, or well, Ghost Art says now shoelace and paper chase, somebody else is going to take your place. My grandfather say, don't hide your head and mama's going to put you in the bed. Don't you know you've got to toe the line? That's a song. 
That's a song, yeah. That's a song. Street poetry. Okay, says, I've seen so much corruption everywhere. Carmen asks, if anyone is in Shasta, California, and gives a link to a raw story piece. A reverse on Selmo, Shasta County. I don't know what that's about, but if Carmen suggests it, it'll be a good piece to read. Brandy says, go start. I laughed reading some of the comment, us damn commies. <laughs> Kay says, Brown was elected by the GOP, by the GOP. Carmen says, uh, you have a raspberry beret, Lisa? It does look like a raspberry beret. I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's a beautiful beret. Kay says, yeah. Brown is already lying about, um, about Nina again. Oh, you were talking about Chantel Brown there. Yeah, she was elected by the GOP. And the money machine. By the GOP and the Israeli nuts. <laughs> Carmen says Brown, okay, is GOP. <laughs> now, shoelace and paper chase, somebody else going to take your place. Papa Joe says, don't hide your face because Mama Bear is going to put you in your place. Don't you know you've got to toe the line? Yeah. I get more and more of that. Carmen says, thanks for your feedback, Hang and Holly. I haven't been online much. Carmen leaves a link to a business insider piece. Student loan debt, uh, the forgiveness, bankruptcy, Biden education, uh, uh, but, uh, but overturn, um, the epileptic man, 2022. Well, that sounds interesting, too. Carmen says, Joe, someone in the BBC tried to discredit uh, Dr. Campbell. I know, Carmen. I was watching that. And Dr. Campbell handled it pretty well. He really did. <laughs> he talked about, oh, there's a, well, there's an agency that I barely heard of out there. I think I heard their name before, uh, the BBC. Then he took them apart in a very yeah. gentle way. And Last 66 says, uh, but, uh, but, um, but Lisa is not elderly. No. Lisa is definitely not elderly. Well, not yet, but I'm getting there. And Kay says, we all have to be careful. And Steve says, sorry, oops, got to go check out the con at 10 p.m. Yesterday, Patrick Lovell sent a message to Joe Rogan today. He has a message for, uh, for Russell Brand. Gatekeepers are censoring Patrick. Why at uh, the Rusty Rockets? I don't know who Rusty Rockets is. And yeah, the censoring is, is, I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, they were talking about starting to lock the internet down and, you know, the censorship. And, uh, I mean, I wake up every day and I'm in this, I, I'm, I, what do I want to say? I compartmentalize all of this stuff because when I start to think about it and connect the dots, I start to realize how fascist the situation is. But it's getting so bad, the censorship now. I know it is. I know it is. Carmen says, at least I get to mention um, Dumpy Incumbents in a great interview because it got shared by Sarandon. The word is probably getting out, huh? No, what, what, no, I did not mention, I said that I was an activist. I didn't tag anything because I was there to do that interview for KRTD. And, and I have, you know, anyway, didn't talk about any other shows. I didn't talk about anything other you than. Just uh, asked him to give his views and he did. And that helped us more than anything else could have. Okay. Well, and, and I did say, though, that I was in, an activist and that I was in that activist space, okay? Um, so, but no, I didn't talk about any shows. But I think, truthfully, 
that 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 interview is the best case for dump the incumbents, Joe. I I think so too. And I've been using it since that interview. I've been connecting it to Dump the Incumbents since that interview. I think you should show it on Dump, the next Dump the Incumbents show. Uh, the show, the interview? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd love to show it. I mean, it's 20 minutes, not even. You've got, you've got what? You've got 120 minutes. So, you know, you don't have to show it all at once, but there, you don't have to go into the beginning. But when you, when he starts getting into, the money washing and how it works and what they're going to do and all of that, right? I mean, if they actually are able to force these endorsements into the convention, man, I want to go. I want to be there. I want to report on it. I want to watch it. I want, oh, that would be beautiful. It'd be a beautiful thing to do that. Yes, indeed. Very much it'd be so. better than the, it would be better than the national convention by a long shot because all that is is lights, camera, bullshit. I know. The state I convention know. is actually for real. They've got to do it. They're going to battle like they're supposed to. So, on asks, what was that old cartoon thing, cartoon thing 3000, where they could make constant commentary on the video movie? Does anyone remember that? I don't know what that is. I'm not sure what that is either. I can't, uh, you know, quite uh, place it. Holly says, um, but, um, but Lana rings a bell. Sandy says, oh, I remember that. I think it is still on TV. Carmen says um, Ellis Winningham was great at exposing the hypocrites. Oh yeah, Ellis was <laughs> he was really wonderful. He had a great barbed sense of humor to stick people with. He was just so excellent at that. We would love to get him on KRTD Media. Every once in a while we try to get him interested. And now that Stephen Hale is doing something on KRTD Media, maybe we can get Alice roped in, too. We will keep trying, because he would be a great addition. Lana says, there is a David Ray and a Ray Pickett. Not sure if that helps, uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but Lisa. Lana says, so we can have that sort of thing with MMT commentary on congressional hearings. Yeah, we could. If, if if we set up coverage of congressional hearings for a couple of hours, we could get some of the MMT people there to comment on it. Well, you know, it would be even more poignant, though, to, like, get it and then rip the parts of it that are pertinent to MMT, right? So that they're not, you know, sitting through that, ugh, so much garbage, right? But then you get to the point where it matters, where they take those sound bites and stick them out on YouTube and they're five minutes long and, you know, they get four million views in a week. Right. And, and that's all the people sucking up the rant, which is, you know, they're going to raise your taxes and blah, 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 all this, all this stuff. It's just crap that keep people believing this bullshit and nobody's fighting it. I mean, we fight it on this level, but we need to fight it publicly in a more pronounced, more prominent, more in your face. We're going to we're we're taking this on. We're sick of this kind of way. Well, we should do this um, in the context of the MMT program that we are developing. We can find ways to do this. I know. Yeah. I think it's a great uh, suggestion okay, to do that. And now we ought to pursue it. K. Ryan says, who um, is Randy? Um, L. Randall Ray. He's a professor at um, the Bard College, okay, in the Levy Institute. Uh, he's one of the three um, MMT fathers, as some of us like to say. Uh, excuse me, Joe. I got to go see my dog's having a fit. Okay. The other two are um, the Warren Mosler, okay, and uh, 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 
uh, Bill Mitchell, who I mentioned, um, you know, a little earlier, okay, in the broadcast. They are the three who originated the MMT synthesis. The first one to get anything in print, okay, was Warren Mosley. Randy and Bill followed uh, soon after, but they were all working together um, at that time. Uh, Stephanie joined them not uh, too much later. Uh, but, um, 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 also, Pavlina Cherniova, someone who was in there almost from the very beginning, maybe the very beginning, uh, was uh, was Matthew uh, uh, Forstatter. Who's a professor, okay, at UMKC. He knows MMT as well, okay, as anybody. He's a tremendous person. And Lana Dell says, how about Greek staff? Okay, or Rowan, both can be pretty cutting. Uh, I, 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 yeah, Rowan can be pretty cutting, but I think Randy in his way, is even more cutting. There's a certain... There's a certain tiredness and pain that Randy projects, which is very relevant to the kinds of criticisms that we are, you know, are looking for. <coughs> and Randy is also very literary sometimes. Very, very eloquent he can be with uh, his writing. Carmen says, oh, great, Sandy. Yeah, I dig Ellis. He snaps. He hurts him so good. Lana says, oh, Randall Ray, PhD in economics and a professor okay, at Bard College and a, uh, a principal research scholar at uh, the Levy Institute. Okay, in New York. Um, Pavlina is the chair okay, of the department, the economics department at Bard College. And uh, 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 Stephanie Kelton is now at Stony Brook, um, you know, on Long Island. So the three of them are now in New York uh, together. Who? Stephanie and who? Um, Stephanie and Randy, okay, and uh, uh, Pavlina Cherniva. Oh, they're all in New York City or New York? All okay. in the New York area. Uh, but Pavlina and Randy, okay, are at Bard. Stephanie is at Stony Brook. Okay. And Kay says, thank you, wasn't familiar with that name. And John B. says, Ray has already testified to Congress, re uh, uh, MMT. His submission was casually dismissed, ignored by Congress reps who were paid not to understand. There is a, a, a YouTube video of Ray uh, out there. Yeah, there is okay, a YouTube video of Ray out there, okay, with a number of other people. But it is not true that his submission was dismissed, okay, ignored okay, by Congress reps, because that testimony occurred in front of uh, John Yarmouth's uh, 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 commission and John Yarmouth uh, committee, I should say, and his committee certainly did not ignore it. They're among the people who now know uh, the MMT, you know, some MMT. So. I disagree with you that uh, uh, they ignored it. They might have appeared to ignore it and dismiss it at the time, but they did not ignore it um, in the longer run. And you John know, you got, was converted. Joe, I really think that if, if when we start doing this kind of thing, like when, when they grab a clip and somebody is up there spewing this, you know, taxation, crap, crap, debt, crap, okay. okay? And we start going after them. I mean, I, I did it for a while. I'm too busy now, but I did a stint for a couple of weeks where I just went after all the, I called them out as blatant idiots. 
and pointed out how ridiculous their economic analysis of how the economy actually works is, right? If we all started doing this, then then you just then we got the experts out there doing these retorts once in a while. I'm not talking about all the time, but you know when they're going to sit down and they're going to start talking about, you know, the debt ceiling, for instance, right? Yeah, the deficit. We can hit them so hard on that. Yeah, uh, you know, right? the myths. Uh, you know, debt to GDP ratio, the level of the debt. All that is crap. It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with fiscal sustainability. As I said, I have books about that. Okay. I have one book. The whole book is devoted to blowing up um, uh, fiscal myths. I must have blown up 40 fiscal myths in that book. It's called I, I, Fiscal Myths of Campaign 2016. I haven't sent you that either yet, Lisa. I was going to say, that's not a title I remember. But, you know, here's the thing, though. There are enough of us out here now that people know. Very, there's not a lot of people that have never heard of MMT, whether or not they understand it. There's way more people now who have a good, strong hold on MMT, right? And and rebuking these politicians is easy. You don't have to have the whole thing figured out to re because these politicians, their talking points are so simple to transparent. Rebuke. Transparent. It's, it's easy. easy. It's it's child's play. They're easy I mean, to demolish. It is child's and play. And we need to do it in real time. We really do. Because if the more we hit them, when they run, when those Republicans get up there and start talking about tax and spend liberals, which is even more of a joke because, oh, Jesus, God in heaven, right? We can't get them to spend on anything, then, except except when they're giving corporate giveaways. But you understand what I'm saying. I We're am. coming into a campaign cycle. Exactly guys. what you're saying. We're coming into a campaign cycle. we got to hit them hard or people are going to buy this bull crap again. And they're going to, you know, it's just time. It's just time. It's time. Okay, so Bill Bradley, no one here yeah. is advocating that people withhold um, by their vote or follow that strategy, okay, in an election cycle. That is uh, suicide. What we are advocating yeah. for is dumping the incumbents of both parties by voting against them, making sure as many of them go down as we can get to go down. We're talking about disrupting the Congress by defeating 150 House people and 17 senators in one cycle. That's not going to be something that will be easy for them to ignore. And our whole point is to get the money out of politics. Mm -hmm. by having people show that it is unacceptable for people to take that money. That's what we're doing. So John B. says, hi, Holly, here's the Ray video. Thank you, John, for bringing the link to the video here. Lana says, we propose dumping incumbents, exact opposite of withholding your vote, re-registered temporarily as Democratic or Republican. If you are in a closed primary state, and depending on who your incumbents are, vote for the challenger. And Bill Bradley says, Lana hates the clap. That is still withhold your vote. You withhold your vote from party chosen incumbents because they don't um, actually deliver. Some suggestion comes up every cycle. No, you don't withhold your vote from party chosen um, um, incumbents. Uh it doesn't matter whether they deliver or not. You withhold your votes from them because they're taking money and you're also withholding your votes from challengers to them who are taking big money. So you're going against both major parties in this way. You're opening the road for third parties. It's different. It's not like withholding your vote. It's disrupting the electoral system that they have uh, uh, um, set up where they funnel voters into one party, okay, or the other. 
he's telling us most voters hold their nose and vote for the party chosen candidate because they buy lesser of evils. We know that. What um, Dunphy and Cummins about is saying both parties are evil because they take the toxic money and they have to be evil because they're captured by the donors. Because it means, okay, as Ron Pocon said, no consequences to vote for one or the other to be channeled into one or the other means they don't face any consequences dump the incumbents means they do face consequences i, I mean I, I don't even understand why anybody wouldn't understand what we're talking about here it is about it is about the money right so it's if your problem. incumbent isn't taking money not a problem and yeah. you know here's the truth of this joe people people are going to vote in their own best interests right yeah. what we're trying to say is if you if you know what we all know which is our governments are fused with corporations and we're in a very 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 bad place anybody who has any understanding of history knows this right and i know that that is you know, oh, God, that's, you know, fascism. When you say fascism, that's hyperbolic. No, we need to get introspective here. It's going to get a lot worse. And we've got to get people at least bare minimum health care before it gets really, really bad. Right. And all the other things we need to get people so that they are not in this situation where we don't care. We don't care that you don't want to work for 725 an hour. Get up off your ass and go work. And we're going to make it so hard that we're going to make sure that you're out there trying to get a job. That's what's going on right now. That is. Right? That, that is what's going on right now. And they are going to put the screws to us harder and harder and harder. So the truth of it is, we don't really have a choice. Yep. We really don't. We've got to uh, get these corporate aligned candidates out of there. We've got to send a message that says no more, no more. We're on to you. You don't get to do this to us because they're not going to give the people what they need. And they yes, yeah, not simply just send them a message, kick them out. Well, yeah. And they send That's the rest right. of them that still sit kick there a message. Yeah. And anybody who's going to run That's after true. them a message. Yeah. Right. And the public. Right. That is absolutely public. right. Okay, folks. Uh, we are coming to the end, I think. It's about 11.07. So we're going to say good night to you. And thank you for the vigorous discussion tonight. Thank you, Bill Bradley, for coming around. And for Carmen, it was so good to see you. Yes, it was wonderful to see you, Carmen and Lana. Thank you for your very strong defense of dumpling incumbents. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And Brandy, thank you for your efforts. Holly, thank you for your efforts. And there is Shane Coughlin, who has joined us, Dem Presidential Candidate 2024. Hillary, Kamala, Gavin, and Cuomo. Yeah. Dump the incumbents and all those taking big money from party committees, which means... Those four people. You guys asking about uh, tests and masks? Um, I got a link to order my free test uh, from the distribution is the Postal Service. And all you do is type in your zip code. So I will go find that link and I will spread it around. Um, just so you guys know, I got that link a couple of days ago. I did order. Nothing's come yet. But uh, all you do is type in your zip code, and then they're supposed to be sending them out. So I'll find that link, and I will send it to Lana and everybody that I know. Carmen, if you're following me on Twitter, if you're on Twitter, follow me, at 50 lines only, and I'll drop it. Sorry, I just want to make sure that everybody heard that. I'll get that. Well, that's link fine. Out. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's good information that people should have. Okay, Lana points out, okay, that Randy lost his wife, plenty of pain, uh, even though he married since. Yeah, that was 
very, very painful. They were very close. And Randy and his wife and her death was totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. Okay. Joe, I got to go because my dog's outside barking. Okay, Lisa. Good night, everybody. See you I'll, soon. I'll be talking to you soon. Oh, yeah. You and I have to talk. I got a couple of things I got to go over with you. Uh, but not yeah. tonight. All right. Not tonight. But I want to talk to you tomorrow morning because we got to get some work done. Yeah, I know we do. And tomorrow's Friday, right? That is right. I, I am ready. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, if you do want to call me, if you do want to talk tonight, I will have a little bit of time. I just got to go get my dog. Good night, everybody. Okay. Bye. Finally made it to Twitter followers today. It took me two weeks to get from 935 followers. Once I got active on Twitter, it wasn't too hard. Carmen says, fantastic. Shane, congratulations. Shane says, long time. Carmen, how are you? Roll with the punches, as, I, as they say, Shane, but I get it. Get up. Thanks for asking. Hope you and your beloved are well and spunky. Shane says, Joe, you need to bring Michael Moneta of Wolfpack on Dumpling Incumbents. He's very much interested in it. Okay. We would love to bring him on. Oh, by the way, on Saturday, we would like to replay... Uh, but um, but, um, but, um, but Lisa's big interview, at least uh, parts of it, on uh, the Dump the Incumbents program. I'm going to talk to Sam about it as well. But just so you know. Okay. Okay, says, by the way, I heard that Biden is backing 401k problems for people. Yeah, yeah, I heard that too. There's an article about that out, which we may cover next week. If you have one, keep an eye on it. Uh, it says, yes, Kay, I saw that earlier. Tag Joe and Lisa. Okay, a few others. Uh, yeah, I think that's where I got it, Lana, from your tagging. And good Lana Karma says, have you guys been able to get the free COVID tests um, via mail yet? How about the three free N95 masks? I'm bringing it up because I suspect that that Santis is holding it up via corrupt uh, DeJoy. It's perfectly possible. Change is another Republican 2024 candidate. But Ron DeSantis. Absolutely true, Shane. It's also true that if everybody followed and dumped the incumbents, all the rules for dumping incumbents, including the rules about defeating challengers who were taking the big money, Ron DeSantis wouldn't have a hope of winning in 2024. Neither would Donald Trump. Neither would any of those folks taking big money from the Republican committees. Lana says, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but shut up, Shane, and smiles. And no mass here in New York City. Lisa, we got to read about um, Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine before they ban that knowledge. It's the only thing keeping me alive. Cinnamon is my lifesaver from uh, diabetes. That's interesting. Very interesting. Holly Hunt says, thank you and good night all. And Dolores says, good night, everyone. Lana says, good night all. Carmen says, Holly. Brandy says, I signed up for the test. Haven't gotten them yet. I ordered it already, but not available so far. Uh, and Holly, uh, Holly Horn says, YW Carmen, I have N95s, but I want the free ones. We have KN95s, and we would like the N95s too, if only just to compare it with uh, uh, the KN95s, which we like a lot. Okay, says night, Lisa. Sandy says, thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Carmen says, uh, thank you, lovely Lisa. And Kay says, night, Sandy. Have a great night, Kay. Uh, and Shane says, uh, but, uh, but, uh, Lisa's interview is at over 40K views on Twitter. I know it is. We need to get it up to a million, Shane. Got to get it up to a million. Okay, says, night, Shane. Hope I get um, internet Saturday, Joe. I hope you do too, Carmen. 
That'd be wonderful. Cases U2, Sandy Moore, Republican candidates, Chris Krisky, Tom Cotton, Pat Toomey, all big money people, all unacceptable. Maybe Ted Cruz, all big money people, all unacceptable. Folks, okay, I got to leave. I'm getting tired. The old Iron Man is getting a little tired. So I'll see you later, folks. Bye.